Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce our guests for today. Um, and we have some incredible, incredible guests, as you can see on the screen. Uh, Dr. John Anderson, Dr. Marilee Cole, Dr. Philip Smith, Dr. Sean Burton, and Dr. William Greeno. Um, I'm going to kick things off by introducing our first speaker, uh, who then will be able to kind of take it from there, and that is Dr. John Anderson. Dr. John Anderson received his bachelor's degree at the College of the Holy Cross in Worcester, Massachusetts, and did medical school right here at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, where he then made one of the best decisions of his life to pursue residency training right here at Baltimore City Hospital, now Johns Hopkins Bayview. Um, after completing residency here at Baltimore City Hospitals, um, he did a nephrology fellowship at the University of Kentucky and has had an illustrious career um, where he has written multiple articles, book chapters, um, served as chief of nephrology at Franklin Square Hospital. Um, he has uh, been a staff nephrologist at the University of Maryland and of course, clinical faculty here at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine and working often at Johns Hopkins Bayview. Um, and so without further ado, I wanted to welcome you up here, Dr. Anderson. We are so happy to, to have you back here. Yes, let me get rid of the mask. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. I thank uh, Dr. Durso for, for letting me do this and everyone else who's cooperated. Um, just a, just a minute, particularly for people online. When I, when I wrote the title, I put the beach down, and I realized that a lot of young people have no idea what that means. Well, well, we're talking about Baltimore City Hospitals, which at the time was known as the beach. Okay, So that's what most of the talk is going to be about. It's also going to be about what's happened in the 50 years since Flip and Merrily and I and others were interns here, and Dr. Burton and Greeno were attendings. If you look at the photographs, these are approximate uh, 50 years apart photographs of the campus. Most of the red brick buildings, except for the Mason Lord building, have been built uh, under the watchful eye of Dr. Mr. Peterson, who's sitting over here with us. And there have been a number of buildings he tore down, too. <laughs> Disclosures, the only one is that Dr. Greeno uh, receives no remuneration for being a director of Sarah Products. So what was the world like in 72? Well, Richard Nixon was president and would be for another couple of years, but Woodward and Bernstein had already started to investigate the Watergate break-in two, two weeks before we came. The Vietnam War was still active and had nearly three more years to go. The Equal Rights Amendment had been passed by Congress. People are still arguing about whether it can be ratified by the states 50 years later. The number one movie was The Godfather, and Roberta Flack had the number one billboard song for the year. Baltimore was a different city. It was much larger, and it was predominantly white. Uh, it was also an industrial city. Uh, Bethlehem Steel, at one point the largest steel maker in the world. General Motors, Crown Cork and Seal, and Lever Brothers were dominant uh, companies. And here we are. The only people here who were in this picture uh, Dr. Burton, who's fourth from the, from the left, from the right, I'm sorry, in the first picture, and I'm in the picture. None of the four women who are on the House staff are in the picture, nor the one African-American man. I don't know what they were doing. And here are the 17 interns. There are also 15 junior residents and eight senior residents. The interns came from Hopkins, Harvard, University of Maryland, Georgetown, Tulane, uh, all over the country. So it was, it was a prominent place to go to even then. The chief of medicine was Charles C.J. Carpenter. He was an infectious disease specialist. He was extremely demanding. He expected us to <coughs> act quickly on certain cases, particularly meningitis and pneumonia. Bob Friedman, who became an ID specialist, when I talked to him a few months ago, said, said that Carpenter actually showed up in the emergency room one night at 3 o'clock to make sure he was actually accomplishing the treatment of the person with meningitis. Carpenter left us, though, after a year to go to Case Western and an illustrious career at Brown. He was followed by Philip Zeev, known to us as Uncle Phil. 27 years, he was a major player 
in the academic involvement of this campus and the physical upgrades. Finally, he was able to say that now this place looks like something you wouldn't be ashamed to see with in public. And as Dr. Bennett uh, once said of him, he had an encyclopedic knowledge of medicine. Uh, he was the go-to person if you were stuck. So this should be interesting for those of you who are house staff now. This is what we used to do. <laughs> there were three teams with three interns and two residents. The admitting intern would come at 7 o'clock in the morning and pre-round on their patients. At 8 o'clock, the admissions from the day before, the entire team would be presented to the entire team. And then we'd go around to see everybody's patients. At 10.30 a.m., a teaching attending would arrive only on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday and be presented one or two cases and may or may not have actually seen the patient. Starting about noon, the admitting intern would begin taking patients, almost always admitted from the ER. At 6 o'clock, that intern would begin covering all of the, pa the team's patients. And there were no night floats and no hospitalists. Hospitalists weren't invented until 1996. Um, the next day, that intern who was on for the night would come in at 7, see his patients or her patients, uh, round, and would begin rounding on all of the patients and take care of them through the day. Sometime around 5 or 6 o'clock at night, if you were lucky, with about 36 hours without sleep, um, you'd be able to go home. Now, there was campus housing. They sense have torn it down, but you just had to walk down where the, the, uh, one of the parking lots is now. We followed our own patients in the ICU, and Flip will tell us a bit about the evolution of the ICU here. And the med we also had medical house staff clinic a half day a week. There were two rotations in the CCU here, one at the CCU at Hopkins Hospital, one on neurology at Hopkins Hospital, and the oncology center was actually here, where the present emergency room is located. It didn't move to Hopkins for about five more years. Um, there were two months in the ER. There were no attendings in the ER. The idea of an ER uh, specialty did not come up until that year, and training for it didn't begin until that year. And in fact, it was very controversial. The first attending in the ER at the beach was in 1973. So what was the good and the bad of it? Well, we had primary responsibility for everything. And we had near continuous follow-up, both of our own patients and everyone else's. So we learned a lot. The junior residents were arrogant enough to tell us there's no authority higher than your resident. Um, they didn't like attendings. And it wasn't true, though. The attendings were universally available. Um, there weren't that many of them, but they were, they were always helpful and very clinically oriented. It was extremely exhausting. Um, that 36 hours, one day I was sent home from the intensive care unit with having auditory hallucinations. The chief resident said, you're done for the day. One intern to be left unnamed uh, quit the first week and headed in his car to the Catoctin Mountains. Uh, he was found somehow and brought back in chains. <laughs> <laughs> Merrily can testify. She had a cover for him. <clears throat> We were Jackson Jills of all trades. Uh, we drew our own patient blood, started our own IVs, did a lot of blood gases because the pulse ox hadn't been invented. It wasn't available clinically until 1980. We did peripheral smears, bone marrow aspirates. We even did uh, rigid sigmoidoscopies. Uh, we had to go to the lab to get our results off of a bulletin board and review x-ray films um, on a carousel downstairs. Um, electronic x-rays were not available until 1993, uh, and that happened at the VA downtown. And we scheduled everything by phone. Information technology was very limited. Paper records, if medical records could find them, often they were lost in some clinic. A textbook of medicine changed the desk. Everybody carried the Washington Manual of Medical Therapeutics, better known as the intern's brain. The library had books and journal only, um, but the chief resident had a key in the middle of the night. 
The only computer I can remember was a digital equipment mini computer they had at the CCU at Hopkins as part of the Myru study. Otherwise, no computers. There were very few medical specialists. The only groups with a large number of attendings were infectious disease and oncology. All the rest had at most one or two, and some had no attendings. The chief residents from Hopkins actually did the, did the service. So Flip, you want to tell us about what happened? Up there? Yeah, you're here. <laughs> so. I just got one of those emergency things about I hadn't declared something. Oh, don't so, worry. Some, well, no, wait a minute. <laughs> so so um, it was a company that went belly up that I was involved in a few years ago. But anyways, what, what I, I want to clearly state, and, and this is a, a paraphrase from Oscar Wilde, uh, I have nothing to, to declare but my intelligence. <laughs> so this, this is um, the head of pulmonary at uh, Bayview in 1972. Um, he is a, a descendant of the Carroll family, um, signer of the Declaration of Independence. And he was a wonderful man, went to Yale and, and then came to Hopkins um, and died a few years um, after I started as an intern. But he was the impetus for uh, me going into pulmonary because he said, there really isn't anyone doing this, so you might think about it. Ne <laughs> next, next slide. Yeah, I just press the, the down button. Okay. There you go. So the first ICU actually was um, here in, in uh, uh, Bayview, um, first in the uh, United States. This Peter Sapphire was a Czechoslovakian um, anesthesiologist who landed here, started the unit, and it was an open unit with multiple um, attendings. When I uh, came back on faculty in 77, the unit was still an open unit, and they decided to make it a closed unit shared with medicine, surgery, and um, neurosurgery. And I put down that I was, quote, director, but in fact, in the beginning, I was more like a referee, trying to protect the medicine beds from the surgeons who wouldn't move. So after, um, after oh, about three, four years later, um, the units finally separated so that there were medical, surgical, and a neurosurgery. This is one uh, slide I think you'd be very interested. This was the, um, at the time of uh, Peter Sapphire, and it um, recites the costs of uh, being in <laughs> the u various units. And you'll note that the average for the 2,000 beds was $25 and included physician's services. That's it. <laughs> Thanks, <Fred. laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't a wasteland. Uh, there was major research going on here. Uh, the infectious disease group with uh, Dr. Greeno and, and others uh, were very important in the development of oral rehydration therapy for, for cholera here and in uh, Bangladesh. Uh, oncology, as I said, was here. At the time, they were mostly doing hematologic malignancies, and they were one of the two early bone marrow transplant centers, including the University of Washington. And gerontology research predates me. Uh, the BLSA started in 58 and is still ongoing. I was surprised to see. Um, the GRC, the old building, was built in 68. Um, and Nathan Schock, of course, was the, was the big builder. That's why the road is named after him. So um, let me just say a few things so I won't embarrass Dr. Greeno. One quote is, uh, potentially the most important in medical advance of the 20th century. No other medical intervention of the century has had the potential to prevent so many deaths over such a short period of time and so little cost. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to make three points. This is a patient we cared for 
It was the Pakistan Cedo Cholera Research Laboratory Hospital in Dhaka, then East Pakistan, uh, in 1960s. And uh, at that point, uh, the Navy, Navy Medical Research Unit, Robert Phillips, had found out the concentration of electrolytes in cholera stool, which was copious, as you can see from what we had to replace. And the, I think to this day, there is still no really good gut replacement solution in our pharmacopeia. We made a solution with a Barnstead still with five grams of sodium chloride, four grams of sodium bicarbonate, and one gram of potassium chloride, which could sustain someone through a week of heavy purging without having electrolyte disturbances. Now, uh, this obviously is an untenable way to treat patients who were poor, often in refugee situations in wartime, and it was clear that this was not scalable to treat cholera patients globally. And at that time, in the early 1960s, there had been an arcane discovery called sodium glucose-linked transport in the Harvard Biophysics Lab and the Air Force, Air, Air Force Laboratories. And uh, the Navy group in Taiwan knew about it, and they made the first observation where they uh, gave cholera patients orally a solution of the appropriate electrolytes and added glucose to it and showed that they did absorb uh, more of the sodium chloride and increase their blood volume. However, the Navy forgot that the gut is a leaky membrane and their so solutions are hyperosmotic and they lost five or six patients at San Lazaro Hospital in 1960. That's never been published. Uh, so uh, the, the key was to develop a, an oral solution that took advantage of the, what we now know as SGLT1 and, uh, and add the electrolytes to it in, a high, in an isosmotic or hypoosmotic fashion. That's why I work with this company. It's made on a rice base, so rice is a source of glucose as you digest it and is hypoosmotic and is the best performing of the oral hydration solutions now. Uh, so uh, the, the next step was in DACA and the Hopkins Group in Calcutta, led by Dr. Carpenter, uh, which uh, we competed cheerfully, but we exchanged data, and our data came out the same way, demonstrating with careful uh, intubation studies that, in fact, uh, cholera patients had a perfectly intact SGLT1. And if you put the appropriate isosmotic uh, electrolytes with glucose, you could, in fact, maintain a cholera patient that had been initially hydrated. This was taken to the field uh, in DACA and shown to work. Uh, and the key uh, development that made it go global was that there was a, a war in 1971 in which Bangladesh became a free nation, no longer East Pakistan. And nine million refugees, refugees flooded into India, many of them around Calcutta in what was called a salt camp. Cholera broke out. And Tom Simpson and Dalip Mahalanabis, who died last week, unfortunately, an Indian pediatrician, there was no IVs available, no doctors, nurses to administer them anyway, and there were thousands of cases of, of cholera. And so they took the packets they made up in the, in the Hopkins Library in Calcutta and simple instructions to mothers and big sisters and took them to the salt camps. And they carefully monitored mortality rates and showed that the mortality from cholera, just giving instructions in a packet and how, how much water to mix up and could reduce the mortality in cholera by about 90%. Uh, this was picked up by the World Health Organization. Uh, Dr. Diman Barua was a member of the Hopkins team in Calcutta, uh, took it to Geneva. It was incorporated into the control program for diarrheal diseases that went global and ultimately incorporated into the UNICEF program, which was labeled GOBI, which was growth charts, oral hydration, breastfeeding, immunizations. And by the end of the century, uh, the under four-year-old mortality rate is estimated to have been reduced by about 80 to 90 percent. Uh, so this is a, a we, we took science where the diarrhea was, and then because it was successful, scaled it globally through the World Organization and, and UNICEF. Uh, the Lancet then trumpeted that the discovery of SGLT1 was the most important medical advance of the 20th century. Not everyone agrees with that, of course. Uh, 
However, uh, now I have noted that SGLT1 uh, blocking agents are a popular drug that I see on the television every evening when I watch the news called Rebelsis. And in looking through the fine print and everything else, there is no mention that people on Rebelsis oral hydration would not work. And at some point, the diabetologist and the cardiovascular doctors are going to have to catch up with history and uh, change that. So uh, this is what I'd like to transmit today. It's been a pleasure. I would say the Bayview campus was the, a key area in the discovery of oral hydration. It's fine tuning. And it also was where we recognize the mechanism of action of cholera toxin. Thank you. Thank you. What a wonderful thing. So the other people who were here at the time were the Robert Wood Johnson scholars. They were senior residents. Uh, some of you may have heard of Robert Brooks. He was an early advocate of short hospital stays, we'll see in a minute. Uh, and the prime mover behind quality of care measures, uh, the Institute of Medicine said that he was the most important person in that endeavor in this country. Uh, Suzanne and Robert Fletcher were also residents here. They went on to be co-editors of the Annals of Internal Medicine, the Journal of General Internal Medicine, and members of the movers of the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. So after our internship, the program changed, um, and it followed the money. Uh, the attendings felt that they weren't being paid enough, and um, they wanted more money reasonably, okay? Um, so they were assigned to see every patient. When we were interns, they didn't. Uh, they performed an h &P. They identified as the responsible physician and saw the patient at least six days a week. The house staff was wary. In fact, some were antagonistic towards it, but it worked out, and it's the model now. Um, in 1984, the notorious Libby Zion case and follow-up by the ACGME uh, changed the way house staff work, reduced the hours dramatically so that people, I hope, don't get hallucinations in the ICU like I did. So Mr. Peterson is here. Uh, he's known as the fiscal surgeon who in 1984 uh, created Francis Scott Key Medical Center and the beach disappeared. So I want to ask Mr. Peterson, is it true that the city actually paid Hopkins to take the place? Actually, we, uh, we paid one dollar. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, uh, the, the essence of the, uh, the arrangement was that uh, we agreed to uh, take it over. The city had been losing about seven million dollars a year in, in accordance with the, the uh, of the, uh, the charter, the city charter, they had to each and every year make up the, uh, the losses by actually doing a transfer of real cash. Uh, and uh, so the, the city had reached the conclusion that they had to divest itself of that ownership responsibility. And uh, literally, well, there was a, a point at which the, uh, the mayor was uh, seriously contemplating putting the sale of the institution out for bid. And uh, Dr. Heisel, who was the, the head of the Johns Hopkins Hospital at the time, who was my boss, said that uh, we really have to uh, look carefully at our responsibility here. And he had conversations behind the scenes with the mayor. And, Long and short of it is, is that the mayor agreed to allow us to come in initially under a management contract to run it for the city uh, if uh, we would do a study to see if our trustees would authorize management to engage in unilateral uh, negotiations with the city, which uh, was done and ultimately led to the, the acquisition. And, there was, there was really uh, no uh, real transfer of uh, dollars. So we took it over with the understanding that we had the responsibility to uh, rebuild it. The city actually kicked in a little bit for deferred maintenance. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the long and the short of it is, is that uh, the, the mayor, to his credit, recognized that Johns Hopkins would be the most responsible party to uh, take over the responsibility going forward. And, uh, so. The result was the enormous building boom, which we can see around us, 
Uh, and finally, in 1984, the acute hospital being built and renamed Johns Hopkins Bayview. So um, one of the things you may have noticed in my initial presentation is there were very few women and only one African-American on the House staff. And Dr. Cole, who was an intern with me, is going to tell me what it was like to be a woman <laughs> as an intern in 1972. Well, I got to say, I loved it. <laughs> it was the first time I got to be and take care of patients, so it was exciting. And John was volatile and impassioned, and <laughs> Flip was there for, this, for his patients. So thanks for inviting me here. Um, in 1970, when I was um, in the 70s, late 60s, 70s, I was a medical student, and there were 10% women. So when I came to train here at BCH, I'm going to call it the beach, um, it was the same percentage. And so I really wasn't surprised at the, at the percentages. I was just kind of surprised that more women weren't in this field. It's such a great field to be in. And I look it up at the audience, and I see lots of women. So that's exciting. But I was naive to some extent. I w really wasn't focused on gender equity and that kind of thing. Um, and so I really wasn't aware of discrimination, but I did note that there weren't that many women working here, so that there was an issue. Uh, so consequently, I've kept, I kept it to myself that I was pregnant when I was a resident and didn't tell anybody. Uh, and one of the nurses called me out and said, Dr. Cole, are you pregnant? Either that or you're eating a lot of food. And <laughs> I said, yeah, I am. Don't tell anybody. Uh, and I did have, I did deliver on my elective months so that I didn't inconvenience anybody. Uh, and post-residency, I really wasn't sure about the work-life balance. I had two kids, and um, I didn't know how I was going to do both this tremendous career that had taken all my time and raising kids. So, and, and my husband got a job in Boston, so we moved up to Boston, and I worked in uh, Boston University Student Health Clinic for five years. I was very much overqualified for this uh, job and bored to death, and he told my kids that I wiped noses and uh, patted people on the back and said, that's all right. And they, they sort of understood, but in any case, um, I was, I was bored, and I needed some more challenge, so I decided to go back into uh, academic medicine. And um, so we're talking about the, uh, the early, late 1990s or early 2000s here. And so I went back uh, into academic medicine as a fellow at Georgetown University Hospital, and I was the um, first primary care resident there. And all, the, all my attendings were subspecialists, so I had five years of in primary care experience, and they, amongst them, had none. So it was an interesting time to be there. And I think they appreciated that I had so much experience, although I sort of minimized it. Um, uh, but it was, a, it was sort of a win-win situation, because I had sus subspecialists at my, uh, at my fingertips. Um, Around that time, after being uh, invited to be part of the academic community um, and brought on as a, a clinical instructor, which is the lowest rung of the ladder, the new Department of Medicine chair from the University of Pennsylvania said, where are all the women? And I was kind of used to the only 10, 15 percent women, so I wasn't thinking about it too much. But he started a study. And the study was to look at gender equity at, at our hospital. Um, and the, the results were horrifying. They were shocking. And they found that uh, women were brought in at a different level than men with the same quali qualifications. They were paid less. And promotion was, took longer. So with all this knowledge, we couldn't sit on our hands. The, you know, we, were, we were empowered by our, our department chair to do something about it. So we started the Society for Medical Women Faculty at our university hospital. And we looked at gender equity, and we complained about salary inequities, and we complained about promotion uh, delays. And 
we fussed and carried on and uh, presented the data mostly. We were very data driven. And it made a difference. I got raises each time we did a, a salary study. I got a, like a five or ten thousand dollar raise. So I, I didn't know I was going to benefit from this, but I did. And promotions moved faster than the promotions did nationally. So we were really making some advances, and uh, the the National American Association of Medical Colleges recognized us for our efforts and for our women's leadership development. Um, so that was pretty exciting. Whoop. Uh, but it wasn't wasn't my thing. Um, I was really my my passion was global health, and so em, emboldened by being uh, the second president of the Society for Medical Women Faculty, I went to my boss and I said, "I'm going to start to go to Africa." two months out of each year. My boss literally said nothing. She said nothing. <laughs> I was waiting for her to say, yes, no, maybe so, but she really didn't say a word. And, um, but she didn't tell me that I couldn't. And so then with the, my exposure to the HIV epidemic at our hospital at that time, so that's the late 1990s, early 2000s, I had been reading about HIV a lot, and that, that worked out to be really important because the HIV epidemic in Africa was just out of control. Um, so as, as I'm working there, the, the heads of this NGO, non-governmental organization, uh, the organization serviced a third of the Cameroonians, so about 8 million Cameroonians. Um, came to me and asked me to write an HIV protocol for their organization. And I'm an internist who had been working in student health for five years and was uh, a clinical faculty on the lowest rung. And um, been, I've been promoted a little bit. But anyhow, my experience was not HIV AIDS. And I was very intimidated by the request. And so I read about 100 articles on HIV AIDS treatment in the United States versus Africa, and put together a protocol, which then was funded by the Mailman's School of Public Health at Columbia University. And so we were a demonstration site in Africa and for the world. Um, that was pretty heady stuff for me, uh, because I had started out as a part-time clinical instructor. And now, with this effort, I was uh, uh, um, associate professor on the clinician educator track, which um, I had not really been that focused on promotion and, and whatever. What, probably I should have been more focused, but I wasn't. In, in, in any case, with my efforts, yeah, I'm good. <laughs> okay, tied up. All right. Uh, with with these efforts. Um, I was really excited starting a global health elective for the residents and that kind of thing. Um, but I really, then my new boss wasn't that supportive, so I went and worked for USAID for um, a minute. But the EVP at the medical school said, come on back under me. Keep doing what you're doing. We like your, what you're doing. So I was reinstated as a professor and we recognized as amongst the first 100 uh, women professors at my institution, honored for service to humanity. Uh, awards and that kind of thing. But my, my comment, I think, would say is that as women became more commonplace in the workplace, they had a greater voice. And, and that was true for me, too. I didn't know I didn't have a voice until I had a voice, and then I knew that, that I hadn't had it. So this is just an exciting time for me to look out and see women in the workforce. I think women bring something to it that men don't bring, and men bring something to it that women don't uh, bring so having both sexes represented is really important. So uh, it was a it was quite a journey and a very rewarding one. And I wouldn't have changed it for the world. It's been great. Thanks, Marley. Yeah. Uh, as my wife would say, who's an MD PhD, uh, women uphold half the world. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the next section is about, has there really been progress in medicine in, in the last 50 years? So I looked at expert opinion, my own experience, and actual data. 
So the expert I found was Scott Jablonski, a historian of medicine at Harvard. And if you look at the first column, you see the, the things that he thinks have been important in the last 50 years. And we'll talk about that first group that I highlighted in yellow. I'm not sure that um, it's that much better than was accomplished in the 50 years prior to that. Antibiotics, antihypertensives, antidepressants, chemotherapy, ICUs were pretty damn important. So I'm a fool. I kept all my discharge summaries from 72 to 75, <laughs> except for the coronary care unit. Somehow they never got to me. So I went through them all. And this is the difference. Uh, someone here gave me the numbers for, for now. Um, we saw younger patients. They were a bit more likely to be male. The white to African-American ratio was about the same, although I think now there are more Hispanic patients being seen. The length of stay was substantially longer. We didn't have any place to send them. There were no outpatient offices. Uh, there were few nursing homes, very few rehabilitation facilities. So most of the time, we followed them up ourselves in clinic. The leading discharge diagnoses on the left is what we saw. On the right is what you guys see now. It's not too much different. This is not the Mayo Clinic, OK? We're not seeing exotic cases. Um, I, on the bottom are a couple of the own, a few unusual cases we saw. So what about hard data? Well, uh, this is the US death rate uh, from the last 50 years. And you can see we're making great progress until the last two or three years. And you know what it, what it is. 75% of that spike is COVID. The rest of it is accidents, mm -hmm. overdoses, and <clears throat> suicide, OK? But cause-specific death rate on the right is, is quite interesting. The cardiologists have done a great job in, in the last 50 years. Um, so have the neurologists. Oncologists, mm, a little bit. Infectious disease, well, they were doing OK until recently. So here's a case I had as an intern. He was a bank president and actually was on the board of directors of Johns Hopkins Hospital. He had chest pain, nausea. He called his friend, a Hopkins doctor, who told him to drive to Hopkins Hospital and take the elevator to the CCU. He had an inferior MI. We did what we could. We monitored him. We would have treated any arrhythmias. He didn't have any. And we prescribed five days of bed rest. Not exactly what goes on with myocardial infarction these days. In fact, not even close. But the first CCO was, CCU in the, in the United States was 10 years before us. 911 had begun to roll out in the United States and of all places, Alabama. Uh, EMTs were not started to be trained about doing anything until 1969. But in 73, we actually did have uh, vocal communication with EMTs and ambulances in the city. What happened? Well, save the myocardium and reperfusion. And these are the events that happened. Um, coronary vein bypass, was coronary bypass was safe in his veins. I was surprised to find out that a Russian had actually done the first intracoronary fibrinolysis in 1975. Angioplasty, uh, angioplasty to, steed M to treat MIs, beta blockers, coronary stenting. I mean, it has changed the game. And emptied coronary care units, I think, for the most part. And then smoking was banned the year before we began as interns. It was banned on television and radio. And you can see the dramatic fall off that happened after that. What about heart failure? Well, this is a patient I saw, class three congestive heart failure, treated with, we did have Lasix, thank God, um, eight, grams, eight, eight kilogram diuresis. The only echocardiogram we could have done was done, were being done by Frank Chatham, who was a fourth year medical student as part of a research project. Um, so we knew nothing about what was going on with the myocardium. They were studying afterload reduction, though. Uh, Constantine Lemus, who is a cardiologist who came uh, a year after I started, was involved in one of the early afterload reduction studies that you can see published in the New England Journal. And of course, congestive heart failure treatments now are dramatically better with many, many modalities with nice numbers needed to treat. In my specialty, nephrology, there are half a million people on dialysis or transplanted, and we've accomplished next to nothing 
about preventing that. Uh, although there are treatments now that mirror cardiology, ACE and ARBs, mineral corticoid receptor blockers, SGLT inhibitors, uh, but the implementation rate after th as of this year has been terrible. Uh, the system that's in place now is just not prepared to do anything that isn't dramatic and, and extraordinary like fibrinolysis in the home. Um, there are lots of things that need to be done yet. What about imaging? Well, these are two cases. One is a guy uh, who had a stroke. There was no doubt about it. And Bob Brooks, who was an advocate of early discharge, actually told me, check his gag reflex. Send him home if he's got one because there's nothing you can do for him. And as long as he can swallow, that's the best we got. Another one was a woman I saw in the neurology service at, at Hopkins who had classical findings, history and physical for, for multiple sclerosis. But there was no treatment and there was no definitive diagnostic test at all. Hounsfeld and Cormick at EMI in England did the first CT scan in 1971 and that's a picture of their first. But the only one we had available was at the NIH. You had to pack a person in an ambulance with a doctor and take that 50 miles trip. And the only thing you could scan was the brain because it was such a slow scan. Anything with movement artifact was useless. You couldn't scan the chest or the abdomen. Uh, Mansfield did the first MRI. The picture is of his postdoc's thumb. Uh, and this is an MRI now of, of multiple sclerosis where we can both diagnose it and effectively treat it to a much better extent than we ever could. And here's another one from the neurology service. I saw a woman, white woman with uh, early onset dementia. Dr. McCann was the attending. He had actually started neurology at Hopkins and he said, this is a rare case of Alzheimer's. Well, four years later, Robert Katzman at Einstein com completely contradicted that when he told us that Alzheimer's may be the fourth or fifth most common cause of death, but we don't even count it. Uh, and that, of course, changed everything. Unfortunately, unlike cardiology, the neurologists have not been very successful in treating it. Um, Jason Karlowish, who is an intern and resident here, rather puckish guy, and is now a professor at Penn, uh, wrote this about, in the Annals of Internal Medicine, about the most recent drug, <coughs> Uh, it just doesn't work, not safely at any rate. Cancer mortality, well, I've, I've, I've pointed arrows at the ones where we've done a decent job. Uh, cancer is down overall. Female breast cancer is better, prostate cancer a bit better, although I don't know how much of that is early detection and, and, and early bias. Uh, colon and rectal, we've done better. Pancreas, we're getting nowhere. Um, stomach cancer somewhat improved. Leukemia is a little better, but most of the rest, nothing much. Cervical cancer, of course, great breakthrough, potential for virtually eliminating it if we can just get people vaccinated. And infectious diseases, well, we've identified most of the hepatitis viruses, although I gather there's one floating around we still don't understand. Um, we have the ability to cure hepatitis C we never saw a case of antibiotic-associated colitis. C. difficile was first identified by Bartlett in 78, and Dr. Greeno and Bennett did a lot of work about C. difficile in nursing homes in the 90s. Lyme disease, the public noticed it. Doctors denied it uh, until the bug was finally found. H. pylori, um, Marshalls and Warren discovered it in 82, were dismissed as cranks, and finally won the Nobel Prize for it and HIV we all know about. So finally, do, does anyone know who Judith Faulkner is? Yeah, she's the second richest self-made woman in the United States. Uh, she, she founded Epic in 1979. Evaluation and management codes coming in in 95 and 97 really propelled it uh, along with the Affordable Care Act mandate. I like electronic medical records. It's far better than writing it out by hand or searching for a chart somewhere. But they're bloated <laughs> and difficult to use sometimes. I w was trying to train AI for COVID to help out uh, Brian Garibaldi. Reading through the charts that are created now is awful. <laughs> 
So Dr. Burton, whose building is named after, he was my, my mother's doctor for many years. Thank you, John. <laughs> Thank you, John. Thank you. He was a nephrologist before. It's, a great, it, it, it's certainly great to be the caboose in this great presentation. But uh, let me share a couple of thoughts, uh, primarily with a focus on primary care development here, and secondly, on geriatrics. This hospital was in the forefront of both of those developments. Uh, uh, so my passion out of medical school and coming into residency was to do primary care. When I got here, there really wasn't any academic primary care, not just here, but anywhere. Uh, I developed a great respect for Ken Lewis, who is the head of cardiology, one of the first cardiologists uh, in academic medicine sitting in the center in the front. Uh, and I thought I would become a cardiologist, but as uh, you've learned, the Vietnam War interfered with uh, training for almost all of us. I spent two years in Southeast Asia and where they told me to be a nephrologist because there were so many kids with renal failure. I learned it. I came back here on the faculty as nephrology. But then as I did that, John, exciting as it was, I liked it. <laughs> but my passion came to the forefront, which was to do primary care. Still wasn't much primary care in academic medicine, certainly not at Hopkins. So I went to see Dr. Zeev. I got to test my passion, thinking he would say, oh, man, why don't you go into private practice? But, but he didn't. He said, that's not a bad idea. We need to be doing something like that. Besides that, the community is anxious to uh, get some docs into the community. So on the slide, you see the creation in the uh, early, mid-1980s of the Southeast Community Health Corporation, a community-run clinic. I was the doc, uh, and many of the docs here came down and participated in the growth and development of primary care. Uh, it was an incredible problem. We had office uh, hours six days a week, many times till eight at night and on Saturday morning. Uh, the clinic was a storefront operation. You can see the building. Uh, on the bottom. Out of that experience came the creation of the first textbook on uh, ambulatory medicine in partnership with Randy Barker, who was developing primary care here uh, in the clinics. And out of that experience came house calls because patients would come to the clinic in stretchers, and we said, that's crazy, <laughs> and began to do house calls. Uh, and then in the mid-'80s, Dr. Zeev called me into the office and said, that's going pretty well. Why don't you move the practice back onto the campus and uh, uh, build the program in geriatrics that Mason Lord, picture on the top, had started in the 1950s before anybody really in the country taking care of older people. Mason Lord died when I was an intern at age uh, 39 and Ed Beecham took over, uh, and uh, Ed said to Dr. Zeev, I, I, I got to retire, <laughs> get somebody to do this, and uh, Phil said, uh, come up here and uh, try to build some geriatrics. So fundamentally, we moved the Southeast Community Medical Office to the Mason Lord Building and started the practice. Geriatrics grew here probably more than any other medical center that didn't have a VA, and probably better than most places of VA, primarily because of the support of Ron Peterson and the institution, and Phil Zeev, who said, you know, there's something important about this, uh, caring for older people. So that's really what blossomed geriatric medicine over the recent years. Thank you. Thanks. What an incredible career. He was a good nephrologist. He really was. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible at dialysis, though. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's it. I mean, that's 50 years of a lot of events. Millions of people saved by Dr. Greeno and his colleagues. Uh, two entire programs created by, by Dr. Burton. The ICU by, uh, by Flip. The entire campus by Zeev and Mr. Peterson and others. Um, it's been a ride. Would I do it again? Yeah, I loved it. It was the best three years of my life. Um, 
Could I do the way it's being done now? My personal experience is that the system is creaky, uh, still with large holes. Uh, it's difficult to get appointments sometimes. The, um, <laughs> there are barriers that are insane, um, but we're doing our best. And, and COVID has really hurt us badly, I think, but opened our eyes to a lot of problems. So I'm done. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Anderson, and all of our amazing speakers. Um, I wanted to say if anyone has any questions in the room, feel free to raise your hand. I'll come to you. I've also been monitoring the chat um, and, and been questions coming in through sure. there. Yeah. So one question that has come up is um, with obviously so wonderful to be able to see those, the experiences you had in residency here at Baltimore City Hospital, any guidance that you would have for our current residents in the room or watching on Zoom from the hospital of the things that would, they should be hopefully taking in to make this experience fulfilling or, or advice that you have for them as they embark upon their careers? Um, this could be for all of our speakers. I think if you listen to Dr. Burton and Dr. Cole and Dr. Smith, the patients are our obligation. And you need to be passionate about doing what you can for the patients as individuals and for fighting or, or improving the system to make it possible. Uh, that's what you need to do. That's our obligation. Our obligation is not to the electronic medical record or the hours we put in or anything else. It's to that person sitting there who didn't choose you probably, who arrived at you by accident, and you owe them a lot. And I, and I would just add, um, I would just add that I found my passion late in the game. At age 55, I started doing global health. But if you can identify your passion early, you can plan your, your career path slowly and in conjunction with the people with whom you work so that it meets the needs of the organization as well as meets your own. So I would say if you can identify your passion, identify it early, and then, then you'll just make your way into a career that's satisfying. For me, um, Flip was asking me about, you know, when did I stop working? And I said, well, I, for pay or, or uh, <laughs> otherwise. Uh, so anyhow, I retired mid-2015 uh, or thereabouts, but I'm not earning money now. I'm still doing global health because I love it. And I love it so much and the people I work with and the effects that it has on the communities. So it doesn't bother me that I'm not paid right now, but the next... You all, you'll be doing, following your passion, and you'll be paying, getting paid for it. So find your passion early, and uh, and then go for it, and don't let barriers stand in the way. You can get around them. Thank you so much. Oh yes, we're at the witch. Well, thank you all so much for honestly coming back here. We're so, we're so grateful um, for all of the the pearls that were provided today. So thank you all. Thanks so much. Uh.